Thank you, Gordon. That was lovely. Good morning and welcome. I'm so pleased to be with you this morning. I am the Reverend Rosemary Morrison, and it is my pleasure and honor to serve as your minister. And thank you for showing up to this house of service, love, and hope, whether you are here in the sanctuary or online this morning or later on. If you are online, I invite you to find a candle and some fire, a little if you have a little chalice at home, and have that at the ready for when we light our chalice here so that you can participate in that at home. We come here from different locations and situation, and we show up for all kinds of reasons. I invite you for a second, for a moment, to think about what some of your reasons are for being here this morning. Our service this morning is called Longing and Belonging. What do you long for? How does belonging to this congregation help with some of those longings? For me, I love, I long to be part of a loving community, to feel like I'm some, that I'm part of something a little bit bigger than myself, even if it's just a little bit bigger. I need to belong to something. May you find something in this service that you can rest in, that challenges you, that makes you glad. May this community open its arms to meet you where you are, to enfold you in love, and to celebrate you in your full humanity. You are welcome, you are wanted, and you are celebrated. Come, let us worship together.
invite Christina and Allie Keats to come forward and light our chalice this morning. And as they do, we have words by Ruth Southworth of communion of heart and soul. For the gift of this day and for our community of spiritual nurture and compassion, we give thanks. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. May our many sparks meet and merge in communion of heart and soul. I'd now invite all of you to join in our first hymn. Um, to show off how good your coffee's working or um, how well you can pretend it works if you didn't have any. Number 361, enter, rejoice, and come in. and it is a participation story so first you have to have a little bit of training you ready it's a pretty hard part so your part is click clack moo click clack moo clickety clack moo you think you can handle it <laughs> all right all right one two three click, click clack moo click clack moo Clickety clack moo. A little quicker. That's kind of draggy, isn't it? Okay, try it again. Click clack, clack moo. Click, click clack moo. Clickety clack moo. Much better. Much better. Okay. It's called click clack moo, and I have to do something with the book because it's having trouble being seen. Okay, I will hold the book. It might not be very steady. Okay. How's that? No. Okay. I thought I'd fixed it. Okay. We'll do our best. Okay. Click, clack, moo. Cows the tight is the name of this story by Dorothy Cronin. Farmer Brown has a problem. His cows like to tight. All day long he hears. Click, clack, moo. Click, clack, moo. Clickety, clack, moo. You're too fast. <laughs> Stay with the group. <laughs> At first, he couldn't believe his ears. Cows that tight? Impossible. Click, clack, moo. Click, clack, moo. Click, clack, moo. Then he couldn't believe his eyes because they typed him a note. Dear Farmer Brown, the barn is very cold at night. We'd like some electric blankets. Sincerely, the cows. It was hard enough that the cows had found the old typewriter in the barn, 
Now they wanted electric blankets. I'm sorry my back's to you over there, but I have to hold the book in a particular way so it doesn't glare online. They wanted electric blankets. No way, said Farmer Brown. No electric blankets. So the cows went on strike, and they left another note. Sorry, we're closed. No milk today. No milk today, cried Farmer Brown. In the background, he heard the cows busy at work. Click, clack, moo. Click, clack, moo. Clickety, clack, moo. <laughs> Very good. Very good. The next day, he got another note. Dear Farmer Brown, the hens are cold too. They'd like electric blankets. Sincerely, the cows. <laughs> the cows were growing impatient with the farmer. They left a new note on the farm door. Closed, no milk, no eggs. No eggs, cried Farmer Brown. In the background, he heard them. <laughs> Click, clack, <laughs> Hands on strike. Who ever heard of such a thing? How can I run a farm with no milk and no eggs? Farmer Brown was furious. Farmer Brown got out his own typewriter. Dear cows and hens, there will be no electric blankets. You are cows and hens. I demand milk and eggs. Sincerely. Farmer Brown, how do you think that went over? <laughs> Sorry, licking my fingers. <laughs> yeah, you're right, not well. So in March is Duck, and Duck was a neutral party. So he brought the ultimatum to the cows. Here he is, walking down the road. The cows held an emergency meeting. <laughs> All the animals gathered around the barn to snoop, but none of them could understand moo. All night long, Farmer Brown waited for an answer. Duck knocked on the door early the next morning. He handed Farmer Brown a note. Dear Farmer Brown, we will exchange our typewriter for electric blankets. <laughs> Leave them outside the barn door, and we will send Duck over with the typewriter. Sincerely, the cows. <laughs> Farmer, deci Farmer Brown decided this was a pretty good deal. <laughs> he left the blankets next to the barn door and waited for Duck to come with the typewriter. But Duck had other ideas. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to uh, morph quite quickly here. The next morning, he got a note. Dear Farmer Brown, <laughs> the pond is very boring. <laughs> We'd like a diving board. <laughs> Sincerely, the ducks. <laughs> and of course, we're not going to say moo this time. We're going to say quack. quack. <laughs> Click, clack, quack. Click, clack, quack. Clickety, clack, quack. And here is Duck diving off of his new diving board. <laughs> okay. What's next? We're going to share our abundance. And just by the way, this story has nothing to do with the service. There will be no notes from ducks or cows, but we are going to ask you politely <laughs> to share your abundance. Um, as you leave the service today, there are, there's going to be um, collection plates put on the side, and we ask you to be generous as you go through. The unidentified, half of the unidentified contributions today are being shared with Child Haven, and th those are the series of orphanages and social um, promotion projects that are run by Fred and Bonnie Cappuccino. 
And uh, if you haven't received, if you don't receive their newsletter, you might not know that uh, the, the generosity that's shown to them is spread many, many, many times over, not just with the children who they serve directly in their orphanages and the staff that they keep employed, but um, just as in here, people who were already struggling have really, really struggled through the COVID times and they've been able to support and help many, many in their community. And so it's just incredible the work that they're able to do. And so if we can support that, I think that would be wonderful. So as we consider that, let's celebrate our possibilities by singing, from you I receive, to you I give. Just waiting for my helper. <laughs> the following words are by, by Erica A. Hewitt. Oh, and before I continue, I should probably say I didn't write this, Susan McCann did, so I have beautiful Pardon speech writing. <laughs> and this, this is going to be our official welcome of our new minister who's been with us for a while, but now we know we like her, so we'll keep her. <laughs> <laughs> and now that she can't get out of the contract, so good enough. <laughs> so the following words are by Erica A. Hewitt. To be a Unitarian Universalist means we will never be done with the work. The work of telling the truth about oppression. The work of resisting any laws, policies, or practices that deny anyone their humanity. The work of stubbornly seeking out the spark of the divine in each other, no matter what the work of creating heaven on earth. To be a Unitarian Universalist also means we're not alone in the work. We are not alone because of our promises to love one another. We are not alone because we are companions on the journey. This morning, we formally welcome the Reverend Rosemary Morrison into our faith community and invite her to join us on our journey as the minister of the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. In this sacred space, we need not be alone. We seek a listening ear, a warm heart, open arms. In this sacred space, place, we join together against the waves of negativity, and oppression in our world. We are a community of individual beings, living our own lives, yet coming together now and then in joyous celebration of spirit and one another. Our differences do not divide us. Rather, they are a source of interest and discovery. We not, need not think alike to love alike. Here, joys are shared and sorrows comforted. We are seen and heard and believed. My compassion overflows. Our hearts reach for one another. We are a gathering of like-hearted people, and here our hearts are filled. We hear the wisdom and counsel of our ministers and that of one another. We have much to learn from one another. So many different colors of truth and ways and methods. In this sacred space, may we find what our spirits desire and what our spirits need. May we be grounded in love and sharing. In this sacred place, may we find acceptance and consideration. May our actions and words echo what we learn here. Reverend Rosemary, it is with great joy that we welcome you as minister to this congregation. With a deep sense of responsibility, we, the members of the Unitarian Church of Edmonton, while adhering to our seven principles, 
pledge to give to you our best in word and deed, to listen to and be responsible and respectful, or responsive, and responsible, I guess, <laughs> and respectful of your concerns, to honor your experience and celebrate our achievements together as we strive to make the Unitarian Church of Edmonton a vibrant, welcoming, and safe space for all who enter our doors. Do you, while adhering to our seven principles, pledge to give your best to our community in word and deed, to listen to and be responsible and respectful of our concerns, to honor our experience and celebrate our achievements while we strive to make the Unitarian Church of Edmonton a vibrant, welcoming, and safe space for all who enter our doors? I certainly do. Then welcome aboard. <laughs> going to do the handshake. We forgot the hand sanitizer. Okay. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> very goofy. All right. Well, thank you very much. It is indeed my pleasure to be here and to be your minister and to be welcomed. Okay, now, one of the things I didn't do at the end of the story was put things back where they're supposed to be. So I'm going to do that, and then we're going to engage in a meditation. There. I need a set person. <laughs> okay, so I invite you now to relax. <sighs> Take a deep cleansing breath to feel the chair under you, supporting you, allowing you to rest into it. Take note of where your body feels the floor, feels the chair, or the couch, or the bed, if you're at home, or whatever you're being supported by. And I invite you to draw your attention to your breath and notice how your chest rises to allow in life and then lets go of all that we no longer need. Our bodies open to accept the life-giving oxygen and we release that which no longer serves us. The meditation words this morning are by Richard Wagamese from his book Embers, One Ojibwe's Meditations. I will read this through once, and if the spirit moves me, I'll read it through again. Then we'll have a short amount of silence, and then we will sing together hymn 1053 in your teal hymn books, and I invite you now to open them and have them open on your lap. And after we sing together hymn number 1053, you may start lighting candles of your joy, cares, concerns, whatever is on your heart. We'll have a short time of silence after the words. <coughs> Richard Wagamy. I am my silence. I am not the busyness of my thoughts or the daily rhythm of my actions. I am not the stuff that constitutes my world. I am not my talk. I am not my action. I am my silence. I am the consciousness that perceives all these things. 
and when I go to my consciousness, to that great pool of silence that observes the intricacies of my life, I am aware that I am me. I take a little time each day to sit in silence so that I can move outward in balance to the great clamor of living. And there's a few moments of silence, and I will read it once more. I am my silence. I am not the busyness of my thoughts or the daily rhythm of my actions. I am not the stuff that constitutes my world. I am not my talk. I am not my actions. I am my silence. I am the consciousness that perceives all these things. When I go into my consciousness, to that great pool of silence that observes the intricacies of my life, I am aware that I am me. So I take a little time each day to sit in silence so that I can move outward in the balance into the great clamor of living. Just a few moments of silence and then we will sing. And when you are ready, if you feel like it, if the Spirit moves you, I invite you to line up along this side and take a candle and light it, and then come and light it, light a candle, and then extinguish your flame in the little glass of water and leave your candle in the basket. COVID safe lighting of the candles. I invite you now.
Would you mind, please, Karen, um, taking another candle and lighting it for all of those things we have lit candles for as we hold them together collectively in our hearts and our minds, knowing we are community. And this is how we show our love for one another and for all the unlit and unspoken joys and concerns in our hearts. Thank you. And so we begin. Um, a few weeks ago, a, a message went out to everyone that um, we would be doing this welcoming service. And if anybody had any questions uh, about me, or none of them were bad, so I was quite relieved about that. So I wouldn't have answered them probably. <laughs> I do have boundaries. <laughs> um, so several questions came in, and uh, I'm going to answer them kind of in order that they came to me, except for at the end. Um, and so the first question that came in was whether or not I was a permanent. Pe people, it seems, maybe not everyone knows what my position is here, title, how I came to be here, and um, what the nature of the contract is. So I am here on a four-year contract, and it is through the UUA. So the Canadian Unitarian Council, when we had our divorce from the UUA, the UUA kept, or the Unitarian Universalist Association, kept all the hiring and the vetting and the, um, the transitions part of... of um, the ministry, so all of the job movement, um, all of the placements, all of the are um, done through the Unitarian Universalist Association, and it's a settlement process or a, a matching process. So it's basic. It's not. It's not unlike online dating, to be honest. The churches put up profiles, and the ministers put up profiles. But the ministers, but the churches can only see the profiles of the ministers that are interested in them. So it's kind of like Bumble. <laughs> you get it. That's good. <laughs> and so I was interested in Edmonton. So therefore, Edmonton could see, you guys could see the search committee. You put together a search committee. And you folks could see my profile, my website, all the things. Um, this huge, it's a huge rigmarole. There's different types of ministry, and contract ministry is just one of them. And they go from consultation, consulting ministry, which might be just a coming in for once a week, once one week a month, or for six months, just to sort help a congregation out a little bit. And then there is interim ministry, which you had last year. And the interim ministry is supposed to go, is a bridge between settled minister and settled minister. It's kind of like the cleansing palate of a 16-course meal. So it's kind of to get you used to not having your settled minister and get some of the things ironed out and give you time to put together a search committee. And if that doesn't work out, often what congregations do is they decide they're going to do a developmental ministry, which is usually a three- to five-year ministry, and it's to do work on specific tasks, so if it comes up during the interim ministry that the congregation isn't ready for a settled minister, often they will go into developmental ministry or contract ministry, which is what you, you folks chose to do, was to, was to advertise for and decide that what you wanted was to have a contract. And so we have a contract, a four-year contract that is renewable. And then the last thing, so all of those are kind of like dating, like the first one is just coffee, <laughs> and then, and then the second one is kind of like lunch, the interim minister, and then a developmental minister. We kind of get into it, so we can have lunch and dinner and sleepovers, <laughs> <laughs> and then the contract minister is a little more solid. No sleepovers, though. <laughs> I, I shouldn't have said that, right? <laughs> And then settled ministry is kind of like getting married. So, 
and that's when you decide to go into search and it's a it's a good long one year process and it's pretty expensive it's 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 a huge long process the search process to for even just a settled minister or, or a, pardon me a contract minister or developmental minister or interim is also quite lengthy and expensive so i hope that answers that question does anybody have a follow up question from that okay this one is my favorite question. Gentlemen in the vestibule, did you want to come in? Do you want to come in? Grab a chair and come and sit over in this corner. I shouldn't have decided it was a gender person. I don't have any. Sorry. Um, so my the second question is, am I related to the Reverend Dr. Mark Morrison-Reed? And no we're not related so when when uh, Reverend Mark and Reverend Donna got married they hyphenated their names so she was Donna Morrison and he was Mark Reed and they both hyphenated their names so they're both Morrison Reeds um, Donna Morrison I met Mark when I was doing a history and polity course at uh, Meadville Lombard in Chicago and he was co-teaching the class and it was my great honor to, to study with him I was it was o I was over the moon anyway so we met and he decided that we must be related I should have asked him if I could tell this story I'm sure I'll let him know anyway so his wife Donna Morrison is a Saskatoon Morrison and the Morrisons in my family are Saskatoon Morrisons and so he decided we were related and so I got my genealogy expert uncle on the job and he determined that indeed we were not related but we call each other cuz anyway <laughs> what drew me to the UU religious community and to be perfectly honest with you I didn't even hadn't even heard of the UU community until 1995 and I was um, part of um, a summer camp on Lake Shushwap with the Kamloops United Church I was working volunteering and um, we had this young man uh, apply to be a camp counselor and he was a Unitarian Universalist and uh, we were very worried that he was going to try to preach hell and brimstone to our kids <laughs> so we brought him in for a second interview to make sure he had his theology right and then he worked out at camp, and I worked out at camp, and then I married him after camp was over. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Not until camp was over. <laughs> so I was there, and that leads me, um, well, actually, so his family was part of the founding family of the Kamloops Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. And so I got involved with them, and I was their music director for 10 years. And I'll even then, I was longing to do this job. The qu next question was, what did you do before you became a minister? I did all kinds of things. Um, well, I went to high school, and then right out of high school, I moved to Edmonton. And I worked for an office placement uh, place, key personnel and office assistance, it was called. So I had a whole bunch of different jobs in Edmonton, and then... Um, I was working at Chapman Brothers down on White Avenue. I don't know if anybody remembers the old Chapman Brothers selling Carhartts and saddles. And, and um, anyways, these women would come into Chapman Brothers, and they were so happy. And they worked at the Royal Bank. And I, I was getting kind of bored with working at Chapman Brothers, even though it was, it was fun. And, but I thought, gee, working at the bank sounds really fun. Because, like, they're always really super happy when they come in. They would come in on their lunch hour. And uh, so I decided I was going to work in a bank. And so I got hired by CIBC, and I worked down on White Avenue by Mill Creek. As it turns out, the young women from the Royal Bank were smoking dope on their lunch hour. <laughs> That's why they were so happy. I worked for CIBC from, uh, from then, right until 1992, when um, they everything went on computer and I lost my job. I was on maternity leave and my job got eliminated, and, and by then I had um, 
I was divorced and with two little kids, and I went back to school. And so I did a social work degree, and um, I worked for Big Brothers Big Sisters. I was a mental health social worker. I worked in the school system as a child care worker, and I also was had ran a family care home. And so I had, uh, while I was in Kamloops, my, my former spouse and I, he's my second husband, we ran, we had 10 foster children. And then when I exited that relationship and moved to Victoria, I had four more. So I ran a family care home and worked in the school with special needs kids. Um, does anybody have a follow-up question? Okay. Hopefully I'm not boring you. <laughs> it's like, it's kind of boring to me. I lived it. It was like, <laughs> yeah. So what prompted me to become a minister is the next question. And I appreciate the question, and I have to take a drink. I think that if I would have had female mentors in the pulpit, I would have known what I wanted to be when I was a child, but I never knew. I never really had any good, clear vision of what I wanted to be or what I wanted to do. But the fact that there are many, were many, they're long deceased, baptized cats in Melfort, Saskatchewan. <laughs> Therefore, I think I was supposed to be a minister. <laughs> Baptism was my favorite game as a child. I was raised in the United Church. In, um, I lived in Saskatchewan from the age of zero to ten. And uh, I have five uncles that were, and one still is, a United Church minister. And my grandfather also, the Reverend Charles Theodore Morrison. So, and so I grew up with men of the clock, cloth in my, in my family. And try to make this a short story because as my what as uh, Karen said to me I don't have to tell you everything all at once but um, when I left my first marriage it was um, it was a tough marriage and I was in some counseling as I left that marriage and um, I went to see the Reverend Sue Laverty at the United Church in Kamloops and she directed me to do a um, a inner child workshop. This was the 90s, and if you remember the 90s, everybody was doing inner child work. So I went to this week-long inner child workshop at Naramata. And we had to do this genogram, and we had to like all of the relationships and people in our families. And, and of course, on my mom's side, it was like minister, 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 minister. <laughs> and this, the leader looked at me straight in the eyes, and she said, is there, uh, well, it's actually not yet, but she sa asked me, is there anyone in your generation that is a minister? And I said, no, but my cousin Donovan uh, became a Methodist minister after that. And she looked me square in the eyes and she said, so you'll be the first then. And it was one of those moments where you just, those words never left me. And, I, and when she said them, I kind of went, is she talking to somebody behind me? <laughs> and as David White says, those, that's the kind of question that doesn't deserve to go away, and it never went away. And so I, I did a social work degree because one of my mentors was a, a social worker, then minister, the Reverend Howard McDermott of the United Church. And I wanted to have a really good grounding in social justice issues. So I did a social work degree I with the intention of going on to ministry. And then I met that guy at camp. And so my life took, took 10 years. So I entered seminary in 2014. My call to ministry was on that day in 1992. So that's what prompted me to become a minister. I think I've always been a minister. And do I have children? And uh, is the next question. I'll, I should ask if there was any follow-up questions. If there, 
if there was anything. Um, yes, I have two children. Uh, Matthew is 30. He was 30 in April, and uh, he was 13 months old when I did that inner child workshop, 14 months old. And his older sister, Elizabeth. Matthew is partnered with Kelsey, and they live in Nelson. She's a nurse, and he is a wildlife biologist. And his area of work is supporting and saving the uh, northern leopard frog habitat. And my daughter Elizabeth lives in Whitehorse, where she holds my grandson hostage. <laughs> and she is a midwife and is employed by the Yukon government as the Im midwifery implementation coordinator for the Yukon government. And her husband, Ghislain, is a scientist doing his master's of science with rocks and water. And he when he tries to explain it to me, my eyes glaze over, so I can't even tell you what his degree is in. So those are my children. And Elizabeth and Ghislaine have one child, Theodore. We call him Theo. And he just turned two. And he, I really like him. <laughs> he and I are close. And the last question, I know who it came from, is... Do you play a musical instrument? And if so, prove it. <laughs> well, I, I haven't had access to my piano in seven years. In 2014, I put my piano into storage. I had three pets. I had a house. So my piano has not been with me since August of 2014, and it arrived back in my house on Wednesday. So we have been reunited. All that to say is I'm really not that good.
do this. <laughs> Thank you. So now comes the sermon. And it's not, yeah, I was going to say, okay, now for the 20-minute sermon. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to say that I wish to thank you all for welcoming me into your lives and into this space. We have made promises to one another. We have admitted to each other that this community is important to us. And we're going to do our best to keep it going. But not just existing. Sure, we belong to this congregation, however long, how we belong to this congregation, however, we long to know what the possibilities are, what impact we can truly have in the community, how we can better learn to welcome those on the margins. And mostly, we long for this pandemic to be over so we can just have a potluck. We have agreed to give each other our best. And with that, we need to remember that sometimes our best isn't the same every day, and sometimes it doesn't look like we're doing our best, but we are. So we need to be patient with one another. We've agreed to be respectful to one another, too. And that means we will need to learn how to speak up when we've been, speak up kindly and in love when we've been hurt. And we need to learn how to manage conflicts well. And we will also need to learn how to be truly welcoming. We will celebrate our achievements, honor our volunteers, reach out into community with our message of hope, justice, and inclusion. I am very grateful to be here and to be welcomed into this congregation and to be given the chance to work with you as you discover your potential. You have the capacity, the capacity to be transformational to many. It will take vision and passion. And I can't wait to see what happens as we join our forces for good in the world. So may it be. Amen. And now we're going to sing another hymn that I didn't know you didn't know. <laughs> I, was, um, I was informed yesterday that you folks didn't know hymn number 1014. Stand, it's called Standing on the Side of Love. And Jason Shelton, the, um, the author of this, has asked that we change the words to answering the call of love. And so if you can remember to not sing the words that are printed, <laughs> which is hard. So you, ha you actually can't look at the book when you sing the chorus. Otherwise, you'll sing the words that are there. So it's we are answering the call of love instead of we are standing on the side of love. And these words were changed to make it more inclusive. We are answering the call of love. Go ahead.
Reverend Rosemary extinguishes our chalice. We have words from Amy Zucker Morgenstern. When we take fire from our chalice, it does not become less. It becomes more. And so we extinguish our chalice, but we take its light and warmth with us, multiplying their power by all of our lives and sharing it with the world. Closing words, L.R. Knott. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. Things can break and things can be mended, but not with time, as they say, with intention. So go out into the world and love intentionally and love extravagantly and love unconditionally. For the broken world waits in darkness for your light, that light in you. So go and share it with the world. Go in peace, go with peace. And I'd like to thank everyone that has participated and contributed to this service. Thank you for your questions and thank you for your interest. And thank you again from the bottom of my heart, for God's name you, and for your community. And of course, do not forget to place your collection in the collection things that are not there. So maybe we need that happen before we leave. The little collection plates need to go beside the doors. And wrap it and exit to the sides and not to the vestibule. Okay, so now we can sing our connecting song, Carry the Flame. Um, the carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Are you, is there anyone not familiar with the, the words to this? Okay. We have some people that I don't recognize, so you never know. Carry the flame. Don't touch one another. <laughs> but look at one another. Thank you.